my name is Christine Harada. I currently work for the federal government and I am, have been involved with climate change for a good number of years now. Uh, and it goes without saying that climate change obviously is a massive issue that we're, that we're facing at the moment. You know, I see many news reports on climate depression, the increasing temperature, if you will, on climate activism. And not just in the news, I see many young folks in my community also suffering from climate despair. So I wanted to take a moment and walk you through why I'm still optimistic about addressing climate change. So I started out my career as an aerospace engineer. I grew up just absolutely loving um, everything air and space, and I started out my career actually building satellites and airplanes for a living. Uh, fun fact, I consider my first two babies the Boeing 777 and the Iridium uh, spacecraft. Uh, <laughs> I still love, absolutely love flying on airplanes. Uh, and fun f another additional fun fact, I named one of my children Apollo. <laughs> uh, I was very much inspired by all things uh, aerospace and uh, also by the President Kennedy's speech about the week choose to go to the moon speech in Rice University back in 1961 and the challenges that it really posed at the time. You know, how he ended up leading the nation to a truly incredible feat of science and engineering. And just to take you back in time for a moment, you know, that challenge, just to sum it up for a moment, we are sending something to an untested, hostile environment, a celestial body that is 240,000 miles away, on a rocket that is 300 feet tall, about the size of an American football field, built of metal alloys, some of which hadn't been invented yet, and assembled with a precision greater than that of a Swiss watch. Oh, and by the way, we still have to like, make sure that we got the person there and got them back safely. Minor challenge. Uh, and I think that one of the great things about that time is that you know, we were able to bring together humanity to be able to accomplish such a technical feat. I think for many of us, you know, looking back at the moment 60 years ago, right, kind of a little bit old timey, but it frequently a lot of the challenges end up just kind of getting brushed away, right? Like we don't pay attention to it because a lot of the moments are captured in, fo in iconic photographs like this, which kind of represent to us that it was a massive technology accomplishment, absolutely true and to the point. But more importantly, it was a tremendous human accomplishment using technology. And that's very much how I view our challenge with climate change today. And I know that many people compare our current challenges to that moonshot. I like to think that as an aerospace engineer, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about in that regard. But if you take a look at the challenge today, you know, we're here facing a similar daunting issue of similar scope and in a similar time frame. When JFK gave that speech in 1961, he said, we choose to go to the moon and, and all, do all the difficult things by this, the end of this decade. Fun fact, we went to the moon in seven years from the time of that speech. And we're very much facing a similar situation today. Analysis by the National Academy of Sciences says the US alone needs to remove about 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually from the atmosphere by 2100. What a ridiculously large number, right? How can you actually just wrap your head around how big that thing is? What a crazy amount of things that we need to do in seven years time. And so I tend to think of addressing the climate change uh, crisis as many different moonshots in parallel. And the key is, let's get moving on as many things as we can. We have the internet now. Back then, it was all analog. Wasn't such thing as digital technology. We can truly share ideas very much at the speed of light. Of course, we change, face many other impediments, not just the technology side of things. In the US, we've got a fairly chaotic Congress. We still have many climate deniers and skeptics who don't believe that we can. And in my line of work in infrastructure permitting, we've got a patchwork of policies and regulatory regimes that certainly makes permitting feel like solving a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle in three dimensions. And in this nation, at least, you know, we have a sad history of building in a somewhat reckless manner. So for example, the national highway system, which is from an economic perspective, a fabulous investment for our nation. Every dollar invested in the national highway system has produced $6 in economic return. But it's also had a number of tragic outcomes for many disadvantaged communities, including my own. Also, land-grant universities are fantastic infrastructure that we've got here in the, in the United States. 
but were also built on lands that were stolen from tribal nations. And so yet another example of amazing infrastructure that also has a sad history. In today's parlance, it's a bit equivalent to building an oil pipeline through the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And so how are we going to address this? Well, it takes a lot of leadership, partnership from all of us everywhere. Here in the US, we just passed the most significant investment and legislation for climate and clean energy solutions in the US history, maybe even the world. Thank you. And some of the highest growing jobs in the nation are a result of that investment in American innovation, retraining workers for higher paying jobs. It's truly an exciting transition. For the first time in our nation's history, the government has made a national commitment to environmental and climate justice and ensuring that we are doing this in as inclusive, as collectively beneficial a manner as much as possible. And to meet this goal, the government's transforming hundreds of federal programs across the government, including investments in clean energy, housing, clean water infrastructure, uh, transit, to ensure that we're shifting from that old model of just one group getting benefits while the others get burdened, to ensuring that all groups get benefits, and to right the past wrongs and to help clean up. So we can take, certainly take lessons from that moonshot effort in the 1960s, because that wasn't just about government funding or investment, right? It took ingenuity from all corners of the United States to make that possible. Academia, industry, research centers, businesses, students, and the government was but one of the players. We are certainly a catalytic player. We can fix policies, we can facilitate and convene, and we need to do that together with all the other sectors together. In my day job, I help organize permitting for large infrastructure projects, uh, which is but one of the entire system. And permitting, of course, is a very uh, key role uh, within the, the overall effort for us to be able to transition ourselves to that clean energy economy and system but we are just but one part of the overall equation. And what are the things that we're doing in, uh, at least certainly in my role in permitting, is ensuring that we're reflecting the views of all the different sectors together so that, again, we can bring this about in a much more equitable and inclusive way. So I want to share some examples of how that's working. The possibility is absolutely there. This is a photo of the largest solar and energy storage project in the US. Just to give you a sense of size, it's got some pretty big numbers. It represents a $1.2 billion investment. It's going to power 400,000 homes during its peak periods. But even more importantly, in my view, it's a true partnership. This is built on Native American tribal lands, where the tribal leadership, the community, partnered with the federal government, with the solar energy developer, with their investors, with the local community, the trades, the contractors, the local unions. And from my perch in the government, we adapted our permitting process to ensure that all of those jurisdictions and interests were represented and balanced. Another great example is the, uh, our current American offshore wind efforts, where we also see some really big numbers. We're going to be deploying 30 gigawatts of energy by 2030, again, seven to eight years' time. The federal government's working with the offshore wind companies to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the local communities, improving working conditions, training up a really diverse workforce to ensure that we're actually delivering on all that stuff, improving working conditions, creating apprenticeship programs and career opportunities for those communities. And we're also undertaking to work to support the build-out of this industry and doing so in a very collaborative manner with investments in ports, the manufacturing facilities for these massive wind turbines, as well as the workforce that's needed to support that build out. That's the kind of leadership and ambition that we need. Tons of small moonshots in parallel. It's not an either or, it's a yes and. And that's how you scale impact. Our role in government is to be the conductor, the facilitator to support all the players. And we have different formats in doing that with policy, Permitting is one of them, and making sure that permitting is not an administrative burden, but supporting these projects in a yes and way is currently my main area of focus. And that's where I'd like to appeal to all the folks listening here today and beyond 
especially to you young folks. Yes and is the approach for how we scale impact. Think of the ways that we can think about how can we partner together. We're gonna have to invent new things, new materials, new business models, new partnerships and relationships. It is absolutely a daunting challenge, but we've done it before and we can do it again and better. Thank you. Thank you.